Now it's real. Let me get this here. All right, it's live, not Memorex. There we go. Hey everybody, Dwayne and Lori here. It is February, 2022. This is our first live stream of 2022. Oh, it is, because we didn't do January. Yeah, so Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, everybody. And it is cold today, even in the house. <laughs> So before I forget, I want to make sure you guys all know if you're um, first time here, welcome. Glad you're here with us. Um, we do actually turn this into a podcast when we're done with the live stream here today. For now, you can only find it on our website, uh, www.eonfarm.com, eonfarm.com. And we will have this posted up there shortly. So if you want just the audio version, you can get it there with a uh, little less time involved, uh, time commitment for you. But one of the things we wanted to um, talk to you guys about today, obviously we're gonna take your questions and do our best to answer them. At the same time, we wanna have a focus as best we can on pruning. So uh, hopefully you guys have started that if you're here in the Northern Hemisphere at least, because it is winter time heading into spring. And so we have at least a couple trees that have broken dormancy so far. Mm -hmm. So you guys know we started our pruning schedule with peaches. That's on purpose because our Florida Prince peaches are the very first tree to break dormancy for us here. They break dormancy before some of our grapevines have completely shed their leaves. So give you an idea of how long of a time that is. So when we're looking at pruning, we always try to follow the, the trees as they go through their dormancy and which one's going to break dormancy first. Hence, we start with peaches. Uh, the rest of our stone fruit is after. The exception is apples because we just saw today that the apples, the golden dorset apples, are just starting to break dormancy. In fact, the potted one mm -hmm. broke dormancy about a week ago. Yeah. So, and that's pretty typical. So we'll start with peaches, bounce over to apples here on the farm, and then we'll go back into stone fruit and finish up the stone fruit before we come back through. So first step in that pruning process is just making sure you get those early dormancy breaking trees done first. So again, for us is peaches. <clears throat> so we've got some folks here with us. Hey, Alan, how's it going? We got a different setup for Lori. So she's going to probably do some talking, but at the same time, she's going to be typing. So you can actually do... I'm going to try <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for us yeah. as best we can. But um, I want to make sure. How's the sound? Let us know how the sound is. Make sure we're okay with that. Yeah, because it sounds okay on our side. It looks like it's working okay on our side. Yeah. I got Cecilia and Rich from Las Vegas. How's it going, guys? How's Vegas? Is it cold? And we've been cold all week. Well, I guess second half of the week. Yeah. Yeah, freezing for the last, what, three, four nights. Yeah, we actually got down to, mm -hmm. I think it was 31 degrees. I don't know if it was yesterday morning, maybe the morning before. So it was, I think it might have been Thursday morning, but yeah. uh, really cold. We had, it was really windy. Yeah, it's been really windy this week. Yeah. So. All right, got food for us fun out there. Howdy, y'all. Oh, good, we got sound. Says, sounds good. Very cool. All right, got Brandon. Hello. Hey, how's it going, Brandon? Cecilia sounds great. Okay, good. Very good. So obviously we, we do want to concentrate a little bit on pruning um, as best we can today. Um, so I want to make sure we get your guys' questions there. For you guys here in Arizona, hopefully you guys are done. So we have, we started fig pruning last week, kind of. Tried to do a live stream that failed miserably. Yeah, it was bad. Mm -hmm, it's pretty bad. Uh, connection out here is tough. So we were, it was a phone connection. We're on the edge of 5G, so we really don't get that. And we really don't even get 4 LTE <laughs> most of the time. So that one was a, that one was kind of a flop. Yeah, we tested it. It seemed good. And we thought, okay, yeah, we can do this. And then not quite in so the much. middle of it, it didn't work out so well. Yeah. So not, if you were on there, so sorry for that. Yeah. We're, I think what we need to do is get a Wi-Fi range extender for the farm. That way we can actually do some of these remotely. Yeah. All right, Cecilia says that getting down to 31 first thing in the morning out yeah. in Vegas. Yeah, so right, we're right there with you. So right there with you. I know it's not as cold in the city because I drive into work and I'm leaving early. So I'm, it's 
5 a.m. here, still dark, 30, 30, you know, 31, 32 degrees. By the time I'm in the city, it's back up into the 40s. So, in fact, I'm not even sure that they that some of the folks in the city clocked chill hours, and we had plenty of them this week. So, yeah. All right, we have Kevin. Hi, guys. Hey, how's it going, Kevin? Uh, when pruning off water spout shoots, is it a waste pruning those to an outward bud? Do they produce, or is it best to prune those all the way back to the branch and look for a better bud? So really when it comes to the water sprouts, people people call those different things. It's just an aggressive growing branch. So it, technically it can still, like if it's a, uh, let's say it's an apple tree, it can still eventually develop spurs. So that does happen. Mm -hmm. um, so although not quite as common or it may take longer. So if you're talking about apple trees, yes, you can prune those back. And then what you're looking for is spur development, assuming it's an apple tree that is spur so it, it's a uh, it actually produces on spurs uh, but if it's uh say a peach tree or some other type of tree that's gone dormant and you're pruning those back um it's up to you so a lot of times say peaches for example don't really have water sprouts per se um really what you're looking at is you would cut that back any new growth that is left on that tree could potentially flower for you um, so it kind of depends on you know what we're talking about uh, the type of fruit but in my opinion, I would still test it. So if it looks like it would be a good scaffold branch, let's say, so a lot of times those water sprouts will be more vertical. So it wouldn't be a good, uh, it wouldn't be a good scaffold branch. But you know, if it's faced, if it's facing it, you know, 45 to 60, 65 degrees, then you might actually be able to use it as a scaffold branch. So that's a possibility as well. Good question though. All right, we have Sam in Santan Valley. Hey, how's it going, Sam? Um, we have Roberto. Hi guys. How's it going, Roberto? Uh, Kevin frost on the mulch two days ago, but think that's the last of it. My plum was the one with a lot of those sprouts. Okay, yeah. So, and with the plum, it, it probably is an honest to goodness water sprout. It would still apply. Now, remember with plums, you are dealing with fruiting spurs on plums. So, you could potentially use that as a scaffold branch if it's angled correctly and it works for you. Um, so again, you're looking for that spur development anyway, and it still could develop on those water sprouts. All right, Sam, I know it's been cold the last few days, but this hasn't been a very cold winter. Are you worried some of the trees won't produce much fruit this year because of chill hours? So that's a really good question. Now, we don't, we don't keep really good track of chill hours. Typically what I do every morning, just out of habit, is I read a few things um, kind of in succession. One of those is always the weather forecast and it gives us the forecast for Whitman. Now it's not perfect and we don't have a digital thermometer here yet. Uh, we do need to get one of those, but um, I, I leave just before sunrise. So I have a good idea if that's pretty close and it's within a degree or two. So what I'm looking for, uh, that weather report gives me by hour what the temperature is. And typically we're getting anywhere from a low of five to six hours of chill hours up to as many as 10 to 12 hours of chill hours basically every day. And we've hit that now for the last couple of months. So, you know, we've got a few hundred chill hours already. So I'm not really too concerned here. Now I am concerned for everybody in the city because you have not seen much in the way of chill hours. But um, if you guys have seen some of the tests that they've done, uh, Dave, uh, Dave Wilson Nurseries in particular, in Irvine, California, they are testing high chill apple varieties and having success with fruiting there. I mean, 1,200, 1,500 chill hours and they're getting fruit. So I think the need for the tree to go dormant, so you have to have that, that hard dormancy on the tree, I think is more critical. Obviously, secondarily is chill hours and historically, those have been pretty accurate, but they're testing some things out. So I'm, I'm not 100% certain that the chill hour number is quite as important as I'm actually getting chill hours and going dormant. I think that's the key. But all that being said, we didn't get a lot of chill hours in the city. Yeah, so, no. I mean, we've gotten over 500 hours out here in Whitman before. Um, and we had gala apples producing like crazy, not surviving the summer, of course, but uh, you know, we can get five or 600 hours out here. So, yeah, just not this year. No. <laughs> all right, I have Daryl. Hello, everyone. How's it going, Daryl? Um, Alan, what's the lowest 
low temp you've had this winter? So we tapped below 30. So we got, I believe it was 29 degrees. Uh, it was the coldest that I saw on uh, my trip into town. So just under, <clears throat> excuse me, just under 30. So I know you've had, uh, you've had some interesting weather out your way too. <laughs> All right, we have David. Damn, I'm going to Asgard later, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. <laughs> All right, so we good? Yeah, I think so. Hey, how's it going, Eric? Good to see you. Look at that. If you get this up here, I can see everybody. Yeah. That works out really good. Look at it, too. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's good. Yes, so we got that, Eric. You guys are taking it easy on us today. <laughs> <laughs> are you guys done with your pruning? Yeah, that's what I want to know. How's everybody else doing with pruning? I know um, Daniel, who's a mm -hmm. regular commenter. Um, I know he's finished his up last week. And he's in Scottsdale, right? He's in Scottsdale. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got a couple of people I know in mm -hmm. uh, Vegas that have reached out that they've finished as well. <clears throat> so, and we're close. So we have figs left to do which we're going to try to get done tomorrow mm -hmm. and we have grapevines which are always last yeah because they're the last to break dormancy yeah so we'll probably do grapes next weekend yeah that's the plan and we're gifting so the the fig cuttings we're keeping to try to start mm -hmm. and the grapevines we're gifting to reed to see if he can get some some grapevines going because he's got rootstock going yeah all right alan yep 23 a few nights back my Ooh. citrus all uh, fried. Yeah, that's way too cold for citrus. <clears throat> well, we had just these last couple nights down at 30, 31. I saw some crisp leaves out on the citrus as well. All the new growth. Were you getting yeah. some new I'm curious. Were you getting some new growth on those trees as well? Um, or is it mainly just the fruit that you're saying is fried? Because I know that's bad too. Especially that's, that's, a hard, that's a hard, hard freeze down that low. Man, that's cold for you. Really cold. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, Eric, since most of my stuff died, there wasn't much to prune. My Florida Prince is blooming like crazy. Yeah, it's it's going nuts. We got some pretty cool footage for the vlog tomorrow from today of the uh, Florida Princes. So. Yeah. Daryl, the winter has been very hard on my citrus. We have had a low of 24. Man, that, that is too much. Especially if you're not just tapping that number and bouncing back up. If you're staying cold, that's, yeah, that's rough on citrus, really rough on citrus. That can kill trees if they're not mature enough. Kevin, I have a question there for citrus. Yes. Oh, I missed it. I'm sorry. That's all right. So yeah, Kevin, um, the question was, any citrus printing for you guys before it warms up? I don't think so. Um, I don't think we have this. All of our citrus trees are really small still. Most of them are one year in the ground. <clears throat> handful or two years in the ground but they're really not to the point now where we would need to do any pruning mm -mm. the only exception is dead branches we've taken some of that off i uh, don't and we did some low branching uh on the lime yeah i believe you, so yeah to keep the bottom mm -hmm. up. yep so we keep those pretty low we don't we never let citrus uh we never prune citrus very high so any long tr a long trunk for us on citrus is two to three feet off the ground just to make sure we're not having to paint trunks after that first season or two but yeah, probably not. Citrus is a tough one because technically you don't really need to prune citrus for production. So you're looking for dying branches, maybe some heavy crossing branches. And, you know, people can prune citrus kind of any way you want. Um, the challenge with citrus, of course, is it's ripe now. It can. We've actually had flowering on citrus because it was so warm and it will flower quickly. Not uncommon to have fruit on the tree and flowering at the same time. So usually for us, we um, we have a tendency to prune citrus kind of as we see it and need it, usually it winds up happening in the spring sometime. That way we cut it back and it gets a nice burst of growth before it starts to stall in the summertime. And ideally what we do is we will pull the harvest from the tree before it flowers. So kind of now would be that time if, if yeah. you're able to. <clears throat> citrus is just tough. You get some of those varieties of citrus where you have fruit that goes in, like some of your, um, some of your larger fruit, you have the ability like your grapefruit you have the ability to have really sweeter fruit into april and you have small fruit on the tree along with that ripening fruit so it, it can be dicey all right so we have is it Mersa? hello from southern california hey socal how's I just it going found your other channel and i'm hope 
And I'm binge watching your fermenting videos. <laughs> oh yeah, cool. <laughs> Yeah, so fermenting, so we found that the key to fermenting, especially certain things, is doing it during the summertime. So because it's warmer in the house. Yeah. And so fermenting really needs that 70, mid-70 range, and it really does well. So if you're cooler, like art, you can see us, we've got long sleeves on tonight. But if you are um, keeping your house warmer and you're in the mid-70s, it, it's fine right now. But... Uh, Oh yeah, we love our fermented stuff. Yeah. So we right now we're ba mainly doing kefir, and we had some zucchini. Yeah, we did do zucchini yep. this winter until we lost oh. the plants. Yeah. So, but zucchini, it's so that's the key with fermenting. If you have if you have harder things like hard veggies, carrots and garlic and things like that, they ferment for quite a while. So a warmer temperature helps. Um, the smaller, more delicate fruit doesn't need to ferment as long. So a cooler temperature is actually okay. But glad you're enjoying those. All right, and then we have Alan <clears throat> leaves all cooked. Yeah, I'm not surprised. And oh, and then Daryl's down to 27. Whew, yeah, it's chilly. Eek. North Carolina, how's it going yeah. in North Carolina? Yeah, I'll bet it's chilly. And we have Marissa has another question Will you yes. be planting additional nut trees aside from your pecans and almonds, macadamia and walnuts, etc.? We had talked a little bit about walnuts, we did kind of want to do that. I, n I don't think we will. I think if we were going to do anything, it's probably going to be additional pecans, maybe some additional almonds. Those two do we did, well in Arizona. Yeah, we did have Reed was um, trying to get some pistachios in. Yeah. So if, if we're able to get a good pistachio variety, we may do those. But yeah, I, pecans and almonds are kind of our go-tos here. They yeah. just do really well. And you guys know us, you know, it's... We, it's not that we can't do those. We could, but they're going to take more work. So, and it's questionable as far as the production. We're more interested in nice, heavy production. So, and things that won't take us quite as much time because there's a lot going on. It's kind of why we don't do much in the way of tropicals. Yeah. All right. So we have, oh, and see, that's Joey and Tiffany. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> hey guys. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hey, how's it going? I was looking at the name and I'm like, Tiff. <laughs> but then she had E-T-H-E-R instead of R. Anyways. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have... Hi, guys. And then we have Sam. How are the mulberry cuttings doing? Mm. So they seem to be doing fine. I mean, we had... There was um, some slight budding out on some of the tips. I can't remember which one. I'm assuming it was the Black Pakistan. So, But they're not swelling at all, which they shouldn't. It's been really cold this week. Um, but we're keeping them pretty moist. Um, we're hopeful that it's going to be fine. One of the things we found with the soil that we put in that bed is we, it's not perfectly flat. There's some high spots and of course the water settles and it's a lot drier there, but because we have them down about eight inches into the ground or eight inches of soil, I don't think it's going to be a problem. I think we're going to be okay. Yeah. I think next week we're supposed to get up close to 80 next week. And mm. so I think we might see some activity i think so too we'll see when we get to that can you believe it's gonna be 80 it's 60 out there right now it's gonna be 80 in a week yeah i can't believe it all right daryl enjoy the paragraphics documentary wish they would do a follow-up i know i i'm just shocked how they can take footage like that and put that together i mean and what's funny is that they were here for over six hours filming mm -hmm. and then it's a 15 minute video yeah a lot of con. I mean, they were con filming constantly. Yeah. I think they spent two hours just filming. We we weren't talking to them. Nothing. They were just yeah. filming. So yeah, that's truly professional. You see what what a difference a professional makes when it comes to editing too. I know. <laughs> it makes our look so bad. Yeah, like child's play. All right. So we have Scott. You guys sent me mulberry cuttings years ago, and I now have huge trees. I remember Scott of the white mulberry and a black mulberry i liked the documentary too those pigs had some serious muscle <laughs> pigs are stocky man they're incredible animals but yeah scott i totally remember i remember packing it packing those things up you sent me some pictures that's awesome to hear that we had that you have trees yeah, how cool is that the, lost the shangri-la yeah that one's a tough one i'm not really surprised at that it can be it can be kind of dicey here even for us when they're growing in the ground during the summertime they can struggle a little bit but yeah. Hey, that's really cool. That's really, really cool. That's a good test for us. Maybe we can do that for folks in the future. We get a lot of folks asking us that. We do, and we just, you know, don't have the time and to to try to focus on it. No. Maybe eventually. 
Yeah. All right, Kevin, right? Congrats on that documentary. Yeah, that was pretty cool. And we're so the same thing. Yes, it was so good. <laughs> yeah, they really, they, and if, I'm hopefully you guys have checked out their other documentaries. They, they've all been done in Arizona mm -hmm. and there's just some impressive ones that are on there. They're just so. really good. Yeah, they, they do a fantastic job and they're great guys. I mean, they hung out with us for what, a couple hours drinking wine and <laughs> yeah. They didn't drink too much. They had to drive. But yeah. uh, we did some wine tasting. And yeah, it was pretty cool having them here. It was cool. Yeah. And they filmed that almost a year ago. So I know um, one of the messages said that, you know, they would have to come back and do kind of a update. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe wait another year or two and, and then really see the yeah. difference. Well, it's totally different now than it yeah. was when they were here. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yep. <clears throat> All right. I think we're caught up here. Very good. All right, so yeah, guys, any questions that you guys have, obviously, you know, we wanted to talk about pruning, uh, but if you guys have any other questions, that's why we're here. Um, so feel free to shoot them out. So is that Aaron? Hey, how's it going, Aaron? I see your content you're kicking out there. That's pretty cool to see. Love yeah, it. Yeah, you're getting all kinds of videos out there. Mm -hmm. Yep. And on small scale, that's the best part about that because mm -hmm. it's what everybody else has in the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's awesome. All right, it's Aaron from Surprise. Yep. Yeah, he's not far from us. Mm mm. Not at all. That's cool. So we had we had a fun time on the vlog today, right? We did. <laughs> it was a nightmare. We had a nightmare day today. <laughs> Everything went wrong that we even tried to do. Uh, all right. So Daryl, yeah. did y'all process some of those turkeys? The answer is yes. We did not process uh, Cuddle Tom. Or BT, um, we basically didn't process any of our favorite turkeys. They're still they're here and they're they're here to stay. Uh, but yeah, we did. Um, we had to process the two gray toms because they had they were just being vicious with each other. I mean, they were torn up, so they were both bleeding from their heads and they would not stop fighting. So and it's a big issue when you have four toms and only six, you know, of the hens, and so it's it, it's not a good enough ratio for yeah. those so we had to we had to take some of the toms out yeah so we have the two uh hull and white toms are both still here so cuddle tom and, and bt so they're both here bt's the top dog but cuddle tom goes toe to toe, -toe, -toe with them so they'll duke it out but they're pretty well matched and so we don't have issues with somebody really getting pounded on yeah so and then we anyway. did process one of the um the girls the too. jennies yeah yeah all right livestock updates yeah, so, um, you, well, you guys will get one tomorrow in the vlog that was our fun with pigs today. Mm -hmm. So still middle of editing that. Um, it's almost done. So we should have that out tomorrow without a problem. Uh, the new layers are getting really close. Yeah, four months old. So we're going to mm -hmm. probably, in the next couple, two weeks or so, we'll probably try to combine everybody. Yeah, that's that's our goal. I think we just want to get through that last bag of chick starter. And that way we get them as long as we can on that. Um, get through that last bag and then go ahead and mix them. So yeah, so that's coming up. Yep, pigs are doing fantastic. They're doing really good. Yep. We have the first four actually go to processor March first. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we got that email out to everybody who will be taking those home. So yep. that's uh, it's tough. We're, that's not a that's not a fun time for us. No, not at all. Yeah. So, but it's part of the deal. So. Uh, so the first four go the, on the first, and for now, the second four go at the end of March, right? Yeah. yeah. All right, and we have Pam. Almost misses. Oh, hey, how's it going, Pam? All right, and then Aaron. Here, once our fruit trees have budded out and flowering, it's not recommended to prune. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, so the, the really the, the major issue is once they start to break dormancy is they start to push sap. That's why you're seeing leaves and flowers. So sap is running back into the branches. So technically, in especially in areas that are not quite as dry as we are, once the sap starts running, it's it's harder for the, uh, the cuts to heal, to kind of heal over. So the biggest challenge is that. You still can prune. And especially for us here in Arizona, it's gonna those are gonna dry so fast that it's just not gonna be an issue. Um, so you definitely can. Once they start to to flower out really well and then leaf out, um, you know it's harder to see what cuts you need to make. So it can get a little more dicey. 
But usually for us here in Arizona, it's really fine. They're going to heal over fine because it's, it's just so dry. Yeah. But that's a good question. All right. And Sam, is now a good time to plant some bare root trees? I purchased a white mulberry and jujube tree that came in bare root. Absolutely. In fact, we have um, bare root trees we're still waiting for to get here in the mail. So you can really plant them at any time now, even in through spring. The issue is simply when they get here, obviously, if it's really warm, um, they're going to break dormancy very, very rapidly, and it's easier for them to dry out because they're coming here and it's warm, mm -hmm. so you could have issues with shipping. But yeah, absolutely. Now is the time to plant yeah, those. absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, David, I've got some fig trees in large pots. They are just two years old and about two meters tall. No figs. Um, yeah, but... They are super large. Any suggestions on making the fruit? Right. So um, that's a really, really tall. You said two meters. So that's a really, really tall tree in a pot. Um, definitely want to cut those back. Uh, you know, potted trees can be a challenge because they're dependent on you for fertilizer. So they need the right nutrition and then obviously water. But assuming that they're fruiting varieties, so I'm going to make that assumption, uh, when they're dormant, assuming they are now, you probably want to bring that down because um, once that tree is brought down and it starts to send side shoots, you're basically telling it, hey, you need to reproduce. So, and it does help to encourage that. That's one of the reasons we prune. Plus, it's very tall. So, you know, if you get branching up much higher, if they're going to stay in pots, you're going to have a hard time keeping them in a pot and keeping them from falling over. So, I would definitely bring that down. Um, and an open center in a potted tree is really the only way to go. Uh, trying to do a some type of central leader or with figs, you can kind of do anything like a lollipop tree if you wanted to. But I would definitely bring that down. Um, you know, that should be a low breaking tree, especially if it's going to stay in a pot. And that should help encourage uh, fruiting as well. Yeah. I right, got Jose uh, from El Paso. Hey, how's it going in El Paso? I used to travel to El Paso mm, once a month for work. Of course, that was, I don't know, 20 years ago. <laughs> Long time ago. <laughs> it's a while ago, but I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with El Paso. Cool little town, and it's uh, it's interesting because you would think of El, El Paso would be very similar to Arizona. In the heat can be, but you guys are a lot colder than we are. So and the soil is a lot different. Um, but uh, still, I know I remember it being hot there, just like it is here in the summertime. Yeah. All right, so Pam, you guys keep inspiring me. I actually pruned my own peaches figs and mulberries that's awesome <laughs> good job yeah and those peaches are going to be all of them will be happy that oh, you did that so excited yeah and yeah you're going to be it's amazing how those trees are going to respond to what you've done um it they're they really are designed to be cut back and it really does encourage fruiting and growth so it's going to do really really well for you that's cool let us know how they come out of dormancy yeah um, you can always email us too mm-hmm all right, so we have Marissa. Will you be getting additional animals on the farm? Yes. So we have, well, so we're hope. Okay. So I want animals that Lori is unsure about, um, but we know for sure goats, right? We're already on the list for goats. Mm -hmm. So we're going to try goats and possibly some sheep. And sheep, because we got a neighbor just north of us that's into sheep. Let me get my water out of everybody's face. It's been there the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we have uh, sheep. Um, our neighbor north of us has sheep, so we'll we'll definitely bring sheep on because the goats and the sheep can stay together. Uh, I think I'm gonna like sheep better, personally. Um, but we also have some additional uh, flighted friends that we're considering this spring, right? Yeah, that we're just we're just trying to figure out um, housing for all the new flighted friends. Yeah. But um, don't want to put anything permanent in and then not want to continue with those flight of friends. So we're trying to figure out maybe some temporary housing to start with. Right. Till we decide if we want to keep them or not. Right. So when we say flighted friends, we mean <clears throat> predominantly ducks, uh, at least a single goose, probably a single goose. Uh, we're considering, con considering a few others. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see uh, as far as that's concerned. Yeah. All right, Jose, can you talk about how to prune jujube trees? Sure. So jujube tree, the, it depends on the tree. What we're noticing with our jujube trees is they, well, first of all, we keep them as a central leader. You don't have to do that, uh, but they do well as a central leader. 
um, which basically just means you have a, a single trunk that continues to grow uh, basically throughout its lifetime. They can get very tall. You can top it at some point in time, and we will. Once it reaches 15 feet tall, what are you going to do with you know something 18 feet off the ground? <clears throat> so bringing the height down if you want to. You can do an open center, but central leader seems to work better with jujube trees. And they do a very good job of creating their own scaffolding and staying pretty balanced. So what we are doing now with our younger jujube trees is we're just making sure that we don't have crossing branches. We don't have any branches that are pointing towards the ground and we take off any dead branches. So your standard pruning. At some point in time, we'll top the tree so we won't let it get a whole lot taller. Uh, but for the most part, they, they grow so aggressively. Um, it's going to be a matter of how big you want it to be. And then just making sure you're establishing the central leader with even scaffolding around the tree. Best way to do it. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so Sam, my ground is really hard. I have lots of rocks in the ground. I struggle to dig a hole. Will this be um, will this be an issue for my jujube tree? So, <clears throat> so what you're describing is similar to ours. We don't have a whole lot of rocks, but <clears throat> excuse me. The key with that is you want to make sure that you are encouraging outward growth on the roots. Jujube trees do very, very well in our hot, dry weather as long as they're getting irrigation. So as long as you're encouraging the outward growth of those roots, so you want them to grow wide as fast as, as, fast as possible, you should be just fine. So I, I would focus on that irrigation for those trees. And then yeah, as far as digging, uh, it, that's tough. I mean, obviously you need to get through, get the rocks out of there, get as much dirt as you, ex excavate as much dirt as you can. Was this the bare root tree? I don't recall. If this is a bare root tree, they're a little bit easier in that regard because they're typically fairly shallow rooted when they're there, when you get them as a bare root. Um, so it's a little bit easier to spread those out, maybe make the hole just a little wider. And then again, encourage that outward growth with your irrigation. All right, so <coughs> MRSA, nice, can't wait for the animals. Okay. Yeah, we, same here. Yeah, food forest fun. I have a drip irrigation question. Mm -hmm. If I've never designed or set up any system before, where would you recommend we go to get a good education about calculations and what equipment is most appropriate. That's a good question. I don't know. Um, usually, I, I'm not sure if you're here in Arizona. If you are, we have a resource for you. Um, so just email us um, so I can get you that. Um, but the, the best thing to do is find somebody who does it for a living. Um, you know, we show you how we irrigate here. So if you take our principles, um, you can ha find somebody that installs irrigation explain what you're wanting to do and typically they will do that for you if you're wanting to do it yourself i don't know i think it's one of those things where you have to just do it i know that was the case for me i just as 20 plus years ago uh, i had a friend of mine that i worked with knew how to do irrigation i was the laborer i was the help he showed me how to do it and from there i've just i've just learned how to do it over time that being said we do have a professional that comes onto the farm uh, so George is our irrigation guy. He lives not far from us here. He was there for the first irrigation on the old farm and I've actually taught him how we irrigate fruit trees and he's now able to take that and we actually use him as a resource whenever we do consultations for folks. So um, I would say if you can find a professional, I would at least have them do some of it. Uh, you know, set up your valve, set up the complicated things and usually if you offer to be free help, especially these days, they're usually willing to allow you to do that. Mm -hmm. So I, that's what I would try to do. Yeah. But if you are here in the area, we can get you George's information through mm -hmm. email us. For sure. All right. I got Jesus Loving Homesteader. Ooh, yes. Yeah. Pruning <laughs> dewberry. Oh, my. I have no idea. Stumped me. I don't know what a dewberry is. I don't know what a dewberry is either. <laughs> I guess if I don't, I, we don't have the ability to look at it right now. So I would have to get back to you. I do not know what a dewberry is. If you can kind of give us an explanation, like is it a, is it a vine, is it a bush? Since it's a berry, I'm assuming it's some type of bush or vine. So you'll have to let me know. Lori's trying to pick it up on her, get it up on her phone here. What else we got? Uh, so Sam, I have a black mission fig tree that seems to struggle to put on growth. I'm in the same zone you are in Arizona. It's been in the ground for two years, and last year I barely got a few figs off of it. Hmm. And it's a black mission fig. So <clears throat> the the issue is that it's not growing. And that's that's kind of the key. I'm not sure. It's it's hard to say for sure. Um, 
obviously there's so many things that go into the growth of a tree. If you're in zone 9B, generally figs do well. Um, you know, they can grow in just about any kind of soil. Um, so they're very versatile that way. Uh, a couple things I would say is make sure that your irrigation is, is on point. Um, it has to be infrequent, but deep, kind of like we show you guys, show you guys here, make sure you're fertilizing it. Um, you do have to fertilize fruit trees. Fig trees grow when they do grow well, they grow rapidly. But if you're not getting it, I, the, my first thought is there's something, there's something going on. <clears throat> There's either something going on with your soil or something with the irrigation. It's usually one of those two things because they should be growing really strongly for you if you're in a similar climate to what we have here. Um, you know, they do need heat. They do like the heat. Um, so if you don't get particularly warm, uh, that could be an issue. Um, although I've seen them grow well in the Pacific Northwest. So in black mission figs are, I mean, that's, that's a production fig. So, yeah, and it's not even one where it's, you know, planted too high or no. low or anything. Unless they can it was, root out. if it was potted, was it, you know, root bound? Is it... Usually they just grow right yeah, out of that, though. I know, even I then, know. it's... I'm not sure. You know what I would say is maybe send us some pictures of the tree in the surrounding yeah. area. Because uh, it's it's kind of hard to... A picture's worth a thousand words there. So our, our email address, by the way, is in the About tab in YouTube. So you can find us there. Uh, he said the tree is about three feet tall. Mm. So that's the block mission. That's really that is really small for a block yeah. mission. They should be growing a few feet every year. Yeah. All right, Daryl, have to be <laughs> careful with goats. They will headbutt you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, that and I'm more concerned about our trees, honestly. Yeah. So keeping them keeping them kind of contained is our 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 goal number one, so that they don't get at the trees. Yeah. But all right, so the dewberry, it's a Texas problem. Texas problems. Oh. But I pulled it up on here, but it's too much information for me to really try to, <laughs> to read it at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, all right, Kevin, with the pruning out of the way, when do you start to fertilize? I'd mm. imagine that you'd want to get it in the ground now mm. as a slow release so it helps the buds that are coming soon. Yes? So <clears throat> the key with fertilizing is you want to be consistent with your fertilizing Yes, if you're using a liquid fertilizer, right now would be the time to apply it. February is fertilizing month, but liquid fertilizers you apply monthly during the growing season. If you're using a granular fertilizer of any kind, that includes composting manure and things like that, but particularly granular fer fer fertilizers, that has to break down and be released into the soil. That takes time. So the trees right now that are breaking bud are actually feeding on our last fertilizer. So what was breaking down from back in September. So what you're doing now in February is you're actually feeding it for spring. So you're feeding it for April and then into May, even into June. And then when you fertilize again in May, that's feeding through the summer. And then your fall is gonna be feeding you basically through fall and into winter and even into the following spring. But yes, to answer your question, basic, yes, now is the time to fertilize. We'll be doing that this month as well. So it, it's definitely time. February is, February is the month. Yeah. I'm just jumping down here a few lines. Um, Alan is saying that we're getting occasional mic static. Hmm. Did you turn that down? I didn't touch it. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure what that is. It might be me spreading out too much. Let me know if that, if that fixes or if there's any other issues. All right. So, Pam, <laughs> the dewberries are a group of species in the... Rubus? Genus rubus section rubus closely related to, to blackberries. blackberries okay so you know i guess the question there would be um how they fruit so if it's like a primocane blackberry where you're getting fruit first year and second year you want to keep that in take that into account i i only know blackberries i don't know dewberries so if that's the case and the canes die back after two years then what you're really only going to do is take you can control size but you're really just taking out the dying canes so that's what happens with blackberries so blackberries will basically sprout. They send runners out. New canes sprout. That's where you get your fruit. The old canes will die. And so what you'll do is basically just cut those off at ground level. Sometimes you can even pull them. Uh, usually we snip them. And then you remove the, the dead canes. But I'm not sure if that's the case with dewberry. All right. And then she has some more information on there too as far as... I'm almost reminiscent of raspberry. <clears throat> Yeah, so again, same thing. Raspberries would have, uh, so they, they fruit and then the canes die. So you have to let me know if that's the case. 
All right, how about a mulberry? I've just, I just discovered we have a five foot tree on the property, fairly small. Okay. We had a video come out today on pruning mulberries. Yeah, so that one kind of details the mulberries. If it's a smaller tree, it depends on the growth. You always want to match your pruning to the aggressiveness of the tree. So if the tree is growing very aggressively, you can be aggressive with your pruning. If it does not grow aggressively, you need to scale back. So we get questions on potted trees, exactly the same. So potted trees, if they're on dwarfing rootstock, are not going to be aggressive. So you wouldn't prune aggressively. So you would just adjust how aggressive you are with it. Um, and then, yeah, with mulberry trees, the video we posted today kind of talks about the fact that you can kind of do anything you want to with mulberries. You can give them an open center if they're if you want to keep everything low and easy to reach. You can let them get really big. You can let them bush out. It sounds like this is probably more of a bushing, I'm assuming, more of a bushing mulberry, like the Illinois Everbearings that we have here on the property. You can make them into a hedge. Uh, so there's a lot of options with mulberry. All right, what plum varieties do you have on in the farm? So straight up plums, we have two. We have a burgundy plum and a Santa Rosa plum, but we also have plum hybrids. So we have combinations of plum and cherry, um, which are fantastic, by the way. Uh, we also have some plum apricot hybrids. So we have a couple different plum apricot hybrids here on the farm. One of them is a flavor grenade, um, Pluot, uh, so plum apricot hybrid. It's specifically there to pollinate our piacatum, our peach apricot plum hybrid. So, But as far as here in Arizona, Burgundy and Santa Rosa, it's hard to go wrong with those two. They both produce really, really well. And of the two, the better tasting fruit is the Santa Rosa, for sure. All right, so we have Emily. Have never caught y'all live Hey, before. how's it going, Emily? Very cool. All right, we have Tasman. Do you accept free labor? I'll be starting <laughs> to build... So I mean, build my AZ homestead later this year mm -hmm. and I'm needing to learn. Yeah. So we've had a few folks ask that and we don't, we really don't. But um, what I would say is join our customer email list. You can do that um, on our website because we do plan on having farm tours. And I find that as folks come here and they see the farm, they kind of see what we're, what we're doing. And then you guys, you'll, you'll have us for questions. So, and it's easier to kind of be here. You know, I can, we can show you what an acre looks like. We can show you what two acres looks like. We can show you what six acres looks like. So you get an idea for space, um, how we have our water, how the house is set up. So you get an idea. Um, I think eventually we will. We've talked about having some actual workshops for things like irrigation. There was a question earlier about that. Mm -hmm. uh, irrigation, uh, also tree planting. tree planting, pruning, things like that. Um, but we, we won't have them at least not this year, at least not this season. So... All right, Kevin. Ah, oh, thanks. I did fertilize in September, so thanks. That makes sense. Very good. Yeah, so you're in good shape, Kevin. It's feeding off of that September fertilizer. All right, so Aaron, do you or have you had any had issues with your citrus yellowing on the new growth? We've noticed our sweet lemon grew very fast this fall, and most of the new growth is a pale green yellowish. Yeah, so it just not, really what it narrows down to for citrus right now is it's generally not growing real aggressive. So chances are good. It's probably just that it's cold. And so that new growth is basically just struggling because it's so cold. We have, uh, we have new growth that is right now crispy brown because it died with the frost. So all of that new growth struggles a bit right now when it's cold. It could be that. Second thing could be too much water. So if you're watering too often, especially this time of year, you could get yellowing on the leaves. And you'll see yellowing, even browning of the leaves. They can wilt uh not dry but wilt if there's too much water so it could also be that and just humidity so if there's you know hu I've, I've seen your yard so you know watering the grass and doing all those other things that's a lot of humidity and a lot of moisture and this time of year we went what almost a month and a half with no irrigation when we were getting rain every couple weeks to give you an idea so all of our trees went at least a month with no irrigation this winter at all so <clears throat> Speaking of irrigation, what month of the year do you <laughs> irrigate trees the least? How many gallons do you give each tree? Can you give a range from your highest, lowest gallons per day or week? Right. So I wouldn't be able to do it per day. We don't water daily for when it comes to the trees. The lowest months of the year are always November, December, January, even February. Um, we always ramp up water as soon as we see trees breaking dormancy. So right now we're watering every week or two. Usually it's every other week. 
January, uh, month of December, I don't think we watered at all. So we might have watered once in December. Uh, and then that was, let's see, we were putting two hours, we were putting 60 gallons on the trees once a month. Uh, so each tree got 60, 60 gallons once, once a month. In January, I think it was the same. We watered once, maybe twice. And then right now, about every other week, they're getting 60 gallons. So it's 60 gallons at a time. But remember, the way we irrigate here and what we're trying to do is we're trying to establish soil around these trees. So a big reason for the, the, the heavier irrigation still is we're trying to maintain the soil life because they still need moisture and it's still very, very dry. So that's kind of what we look at. Now, the other question was the opposite of that. So the heaviest irrigation that we do is during the summertime, we're watering once or twice a week and those trees are getting upwards of about 100 gallons a week. So it's a lot, it's a lot. And again, remember, we're trying to build soil. So it's a combination of what the tree needs and soil building. We're doing both of those with that much water. You can get away with less, but I would not do that more frequently. So we'd answered a question for Aaron earlier with maybe some issues with yellowing the leaves. If you're watering too frequently, you cause issues. So deep and infrequent, no matter what time of year. All right, so Sam, I have a Santa Rosa plum tree that has doubled in size in two years. Yeah. It has flowered, but never produced any fruit. Mm -hmm. It was the last tree to break dormancy last year. Completely normal. Mm. It's exactly what happens with ours. Um, I grew up with a Santa Rosa plum tree in Gardena, California, and that tree barely went dormant, got basically no chill hours, and overproduced like crazy, but got nothing for the first three or four years. So in ideal conditions, that area was pretty much ideal. And here we see the exact same thing. Uh, we didn't get fruit. I think the last year we were there, we finally got fruit off that tree. So it was four years old on the old property. Mm -hmm. So it took four years to get fruit. And it was very few. And they, they were not very good um, because this tree was still too young. So very common. You need to give it, it needs a few years. And it will be the last one to break dormancy. Just make sure we did a pruning video. So back to pruning. Make sure you're not pruning off the fruiting spurs. So those develop on your older branches, your larger branches. They're short, like two to three inch spiky branches. You want to make sure you're not cutting those off. That's your fruit. All right. So we have Dan. Howdy, folks. Eating some winter tomatoes for lunch as I watch. Ooh, yes. Thanks again. Mm. Tomatoes. And then we have Bob that had commented on the yellow leaves. When temps are below 55, your tree is probably not getting iron due to the pH changing from the weather. Mm -hmm. It looks like Could Aaron that well. saw that. Mm -hmm. uh, Tasman, how big is your well pump? Uh, so the well pump is two horsepower. Uh, well, we have. So I'm assuming you mean the one down on the ground. So that one's two horsepower. I actually I don't know what our I don't know what our pressure pump is. I believe it's the same. It may, no, I take that back. I think it's less, uh, but the well pump is two horsepower and it pumps, I believe 13 gallons per minute. Um, in, it stays pretty steady that way. And the whole system is basically designed around 13 gallons per minute. <clears throat> all right, and then thanks for all the answers about irrigation. All right, I think we are caught up on those. Very good. And we're getting in 348, so not bad. Yep. So obviously we got everybody here today. I think one of the things that I want to make sure we um, do before we jump off here, I want to make sure that we um, are doing what you guys want when it comes to these live streams. We wanted to do one more specific today as opposed to a general Q&A. And we want to make sure that we're giving you guys the content that you want. We do put these on the website as a podcast. So we want to make sure that they're informational and educational which we try to do with everything here on the farm. Uh, but if there's specific topics you want us to cover, um, the other thing is time. So we have this at three o'clock in the afternoon on Saturdays because it works for us. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you guys think that uh, a different time would be better, we definitely want that input. All right, so it looks like GPM, so gallons per minute as far as um, the pump. Yeah, so the gallons per minute is 13. And part of that is because we're restricted with how many gallons per minute we can pull from the ground. Now we're nowhere near the limit. I think it's 35 gallons per minute, um, but 13 gallons is, is what we're pulling, which is one of the reasons our tank is 5,000 gallons. It's bigger. Yep. All right, and then we have, is it Terrell? 
how mm-hmm. often do you water your grapevines during the growing season? There is no videos instructing how to do this. My vines always die. Okay, that's that's usually never good when your vines are dying. And and grapevines are so hardy um, that that's not a good sign. So we typically water our grapevines more frequently than our fruit trees. Usually during the summertime, that's two to three times per week. And it's because they're on drip irrigation. Um, and especially when they're younger, we water them a little more often. Um, and we find that they grow very, very well with that schedule. So I believe at the peak of summer, we're at three days a week. So not every day. And with that, we have two gallon per hour emitters on either side of each vine. And it's running for two hours each time. So they're getting, what, eight gallons three times a week. So they're getting 24 gallons a week of water during the peak of summer. Here in the wintertime, same as the rest of our fruit trees, they're getting watered very rarely. So once a month, I think in December, once or twice in January, and we're down to uh, one hour on those. So they're only getting about four gallons each time they water. Because they're dormant. didn't water them as much because of the rain. So Correct. Just, just in case he wasn't on there before. like Correct. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> All right. So do you use any gray water? No, um, we don't. So, well, okay. No, not out of the house. <laughs> and the reason why is we used a regular contractor. And Maricopa has very, very, very disturbingly strict guidelines when it comes to legally using gray water. Which... I won't get into my frustrations <laughs> with government entities, but this this is definitely one of those sticking points with me. Uh, we're we're planted in Maricopa County. We're not going to go anywhere. But um, yeah, they we we can't legally use gray water for basically anything. It has to go into the septic system. So what we do is we do passive catchment and all those things. But as far as the house is concerned, we don't we can't legally use gray water outside of the septic system. As silly as that sounds, but. Uh, there's a lot of silly things that the government does, as we all know. All right, so we have Pam. I would like to see more... Definitive? Uh, numbers on watering and fertilizer and planting. Mm-hmm. So how much B1 in the new holes, as an example? Sure, so we follow the instructions on the bottle. Um, I think it's two tablespoons per gallon. Um, so I think we usually do four tablespoons for the two-gallon container that we have. She's saying like in, um, I think, videos and stuff. So when we're doing videos to make oh, sure that we're like giving... To specify that we can Better do. numbers and stuff. Jose, have you Thank been you getting... Feedback. Have you been getting cold winter days lately? Are your tropical trees struggling? My bamboo is struggling. Yeah, Jose, it, I'll tell you what. This, this is actually the reason we do not plant tropical trees here on this farm. It's because of this time of year and the middle of summer because they can struggle on both sides. We have two guava trees as basically tests. We have a pink guava and a white guava. We cover them at night right now. Whenever we dip below 36 degrees, we cover them at night. We uncover them when the sun finally hits them in the morning. So you will have to do that with your tropical trees. Once you get below 30 degrees, depending on the tropical, you actually have to heat it. Yes, you need to give it supplemental heat in order for them to survive. So cover them and heat them. So um, so that's why we won't do them not that we can't but we won't so um so that's it's always going to be the struggle for you um especially if you're outside the city like we are it's colder you know we're down into the 20s it never hit the 20s in the city this year so you know they were five or six degrees cooler than that mid 30s there's a big difference between 29 degrees and 35 degrees so uh but even at 35 they struggle so yeah All right, Food Forest Fund, please don't do the live streams any later in the day. In fact, earlier in the day is better. I'm in West Africa and already staying up late to watch Oh my goodness, thank you for being here. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, West Africa, that is so cool. cool. I imagine, I, I, I cannot imagine growing in West Africa, but I imagine folks can't imagine us growing in Arizona. So that's really cool. And I, I understand that. Thank you for the feedback. Uh, we have year-old fig trees in pots, but have decided to put them in ground. Good choice. Um, is right now the perfect time? Yes. This is the best time to plant really any tree except for a tropical. So you don't want, you would never want to plant tropical trees right now. But every other tree is on the table. The only other ones I might consider waiting for another few weeks is citrus. Um, only because... Citrus trees do not like the cold, uh, especially if it gets really cold. And because they're in pots, 
uh, you can move them around. So you can kind of put them in a, in a garage if you needed to on a freezing night. But anything else is on the table. Uh, if it's a stone fruit, palm fruit, berries, uh, all those are, you're good to go. All right, so we have some, okay, thanks, thank you. So the vines, he wasn't, do, uh, they weren't doing enough water, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. uh, yet very silly, I think that was back on the government. Yes. <laughs> I have stronger um, words to say, but I'll refrain. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, guys. Oh, Olga and Slack here. It's mm. great to see you. Thank you all. Thank you for all your content. Yeah, cool. How's it going? They should be, you guys are coming out, oh, towards the end of the month. They're mm. the ones coming out from, was it New York? I think so. I think it was New York. Pretty sure. Um, Transplant Farm, caught a live session. What's up, guys? From Howdy. down here in Pima City. Ooh, hello. Imagine you guys are getting cold, too, down there. Well, not for long. <laughs> yeah. Ever considered a greenhouse for tropical trees? Wondering if there is any unique benefit to them in our climate, both winter and summer. Um, so as far as greenhouses... Okay, so greenhouses are very good for starting plants in Arizona. Um, greenhouses are horrible for anything in the middle of summer. It doesn't matter what it is. They're going to die in a greenhouse. Uh, in the middle of winter, if it's a tropical, it, we'll take a step back. So a greenhouse is going to warm up during the day, maybe get very hot during the day, and it will cool off substantially at night. In fact, a greenhouse typically is the exact same temperature inside the greenhouse as it is outside the greenhouse, especially in the middle of winter. So, but it warms up during the day. So you may still find that you have to have supplemental heat in a greenhouse for a tropical tree. Now, I'm assuming you mean that the tropical tree is also in a pot, which is a further complication because the roots are not, or they're basically exposed. So that, that's why tropicals can just be tough all around because they're going to probably need some supplemental heat, even in a greenhouse in the middle of night in the winter time so not to say it can't be done it definitely can so and folks are growing these in the city you know the city is five to ten degrees warmer than we are out here so you know you have a lot more possibility and people are doing it you know they're growing mango trees and star fruit and you name it in the city so if that's your location i think you definitely could um, but again back to the greenhouse yes at some point we probably will have a greenhouse on the farm and it's going to be primarily for starts so in fact, no. right now. So we would be using it now to start plants that we're gonna be putting in the ground two to three weeks from now. All right, so we have, Bob, before I planted my orchard, I wish I had placed 10 inches of leaf mold, hummus, hummus under the area. It's less than a dollar per square foot delivered. Yeah, definitely wouldn't hurt it, that's for sure. Uh, Jose, I love your weekly vlogs. You guys are an inspiration. Oh. Always look forward to your videos. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Thanks. I'm glad you enjoy them. The vlogs we enjoy too, because we get a chance to kind of mess around a little bit. It gives us a little bit of a break on a Saturday, kind of. Yeah. Okay, not really. Right. <laughs> but we still enjoy them. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, just planted 25 trees in fall in Maricopa City. Very good. That is awesome. That's what, fantastic. Yeah. What type of trees were they like stone fruit, citrus? That's a great, that's great. I don't yeah. know if that's the beginning of your orchard, but that's a, that's a good, strong number of trees. Yep. All right. So yes, New York city. Can't wait to meet you both. Yeah. Let us know when Very you're cool. in town. If you guys are able to come out, we'd love to meet you guys too. Absolutely. And I still haven't, you know, I don't think I'm going to have beef for you. I'm sorry. We've been working on beef. Yeah. Um, all right, and Pam, in Apache Junction, I'm struggling with my strawberry tree. It has two feet of mulch, three sets of lights, and burlap on two sides to keep her warm. Yeah, I know. I know. In Apache Junction, it's far enough out of the city. I'm sure you're finding, just like we are, it's cooler. It's just a struggle to do. It's just going to take more work. You know, it just is. So, especially for all of us outside of the city. Yeah. So, it's the reason why we just won't do them. You know, it again, back to, it's not a matter of not being able to, we, I'm sure we could figure it out, but we just do not, we don't want to spend time baby in the trees. We just, it's not, there's too much other things going on. We already basically do not have enough time to get everything done, which is okay. It's not a, it's, it's, it's a good problem to have, but uh, we can't throw something on top of it because we have a lot of other things that we want to get going here on the farm. 
So yeah, that's just why we won't do it. And that's you know we do have the couple that we cover with sheets, but that's like the max of where we're yeah willing and, to put in. At and the even moment. those, if we hit twenty degrees again like we did a few years ago. It's gonna kill those. So yeah. All right. So Rob, do you know if Maricopa County has any regs on use of residential? Rainwater. I, I am not aware of any regulations against using rainwater. So a lot of folks do catchment here. You know, we do passive catchment, but I know a lot of folks in the city do actual rainwater catchment. That's not an issue. Their issue is specifically with gray water because it, apparently there's cooties in it and it will kill you. I don't know. Yeah. I really don't know. And the rainwater, you know, as far as catchment, our biggest challenge is, is getting enough rain because we got four inches of rain last year. And mm -hmm. so it's just... Not enough for us to try to do that and yeah, but, sustain but, stuff. But to to your point, there's there's no regulations against uh, catchment as far as rainwater. That's that's not an issue in Maricopa. So they just went sideways on the gray water for some reason. All right. So we are turning our front yard into an orchard next year. We are getting the ground prepared, plums, peaches, apples, and persimmons. Awesome. That's really cool. Do it. That's a fantastic assortment. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Great content and inspiration. We have decided to sell our home in order to buy our own land and build a farm like you. <laughs> yes. I love hearing that. I wish we could get more oh, and more people awesome. to do that. That's like my favorite thing to hear. I'm like, I better not start crying. <laughs> <laughs> it happens pretty easy for me. That is fantastic. That's I love cool. that. I love it. I, I really, I so wish that more people would do that. You know, we hear from folks all the time from all over the place. I had people, I had a young couple in New York that has a 10 year plan to get out of New York City somewhere out West or in, in the Southeast specifically so they can be on land so they can grow their own, grow their own food and be more sustainable. I mean, yeah. Yeah. that's just, that's just fantastic. So where is your land? Need to know. Need to yeah. know. If you found it yet or or not. Um, okay, so have you ever considered planting that comfrey mm -hmm. Russian Bocking one fourteen? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I understand it is super good for it, our soil. It is really good for the soil. The the challenge here more than anything is just wherever that would be, you have to have irrigation. That's the key. So because it, it's a broad leaf. So it needs to be irrigated regularly, just like grass. So you're going to be watering it basically every day or two in the summertime. Uh, so that's that's going to be the key with that particular that particular plant. But yeah, it's okay. fantastic. Chop and drop. All right. So we have hello and love to the Canada truckers. Oh, amen to that. My goodness. My goodness gracious. Are they under some pressure? Amen to that. Rob, awesome. Thank you. Howdy, y'all from AZ Highland Homestead. Hey, how's it going? We have Aaron. We have about 400 gallons of rainwater collection in our backyard. We primarily use the water to fill the pond when it's needed and when we use our pond water to water our fruit trees. There you go. Very Aaron, nice. you got it down, man. All right. June, City of Glendale teaches us to collect rainwater mm -hmm. to use in gardens. Yep. Yeah, rainwater's not a problem. It's the yeah. gray water that's the rub. Um, then Aaron, Arizona, and a few other states encourage rainwater collection. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Transplanted farm started. Start planting my thirty-eight trees tomorrow. Eight peaches, Ooh. eight plums, pluots, eight apples, ten citrus, pears, and mulberries. Fantastic! Too. You literally are a transplanted farm at that point. That is so cool. <laughs> You're gonna have such a cool food forest. Yes, you are. Taz, me and my dad sold our place here in Washington, and we purchased 40 acres in Wilcox. Woo! Um, Be there in March to clear for the homestead. Nice. Fantastic. Love it. Very Love cool. it. 40 acres is a ton of space. Yeah. A lot of space. You're going to have a lot That's of open area. a lot area. of space. Yeah. Three generations right. together. How cool is that, man? That is so cool. I'll tell you what. we, I, My son, I work with him every day. He... He was always the one that never wanted to touch any work outside. Very much the gamer. He's the he's our IT manager at work. And he was saying how excited he is to finally start growing some food one of these days. That is a major convert. We got some converts today. This is fantastic. 
All right, so AZ Highland Homesteads, we are up in Prescott. Very um, good. What would Beautiful. you do differently in a cool, a colder environment that's still dry? Yeah, so obviously irrigation is still going to be the key. You still need water. So, um, you know, consistent water, run your irrigation because you're going to need it. Now, if we get normal monsoons, you're going to be okay. You're going to get some moisture in the summertime where we typically don't see it down here. We can see that area from where we are here in Whitman. Yeah. So the biggest thing is going to be varieties. So you will have some varieties that may not do as well. Citrus will be a bit of a struggle. It's a bit too cold. Um, but at the same time, you're going to be able to do some higher chill varieties that we can't do down here. Mm -hmm. And, and hugely cherries because we would have a cherry tree in a heartbeat in Prescott. So, but the, a lot of the things that you're going to see here are very much the same. And these uh, stone fruit, palm fruit, uh, berry varieties, all the things you see us growing here, you still can. You're just going to have some other opportunities there. Shy of citrus, which you still be able to do, but you're going to have some other options for some higher chill stuff, which is cool. Press yeah. it's beautiful. That's really nice. All right, so I have 37 acres up north. We are going to start a farm. Awesome, awesome. This will be our last year in Phoenix. Hope Very to good. get out before summer hits. Very good. Yeah. Good choice. All 37 right. acres. Again, a lot of space. That's fantastic. That's, that's yeah, that is. Um, Bob Slacker, you want your gray water to go through treatment. Lots of the gray water systems here will leave your fingers oh. infected if you touch the soil. Good to know. See, I always think, when for me, when I think of gray water, I think of the brackish water that comes out of the sink, uh, out of laundry. I mean, that's my two primary ones that I think of. But yeah, you'd have to change uh, your soaps and things like that for folks that I know that can use it. We just don't, we can't. And so I, I don't, I'm not a good resource for that. All right, so hello, my lemon Meyer tree has flowers on it. Mm -hmm. Does that mean I should have lemons this year? Not necessarily. So though Meyer lemon trees flower like bonkers in pots, just out of pots, almost all year. So they are, they are just heavy, heavy flowers, sometimes to the detriment of their leaves, which is can be a challenge for your Meyer lemon trees. Um, what I would suggest if it's a young tree, it's you're gonna have a hard time doing this, is removing the flower buds, eat, be careful, don't break branches and don't rip off leaves, is to remove some of those. It needs to concentrate on leaf development for the first couple of years before it starts to fruit. It may try and it may even be able to set some fruit, but you don't want it doing that for the first couple of years. It's going to try like crazy though. Those things are psycho when it comes to flowering. Yeah. And you know, you can maybe leave a couple on there. But yeah, as long as, you know, if it's flowering, as long as it's, you know pollinated and yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right uh riverside county in Woo california but so expensive oh yeah no doubt about that no doubt about that all right and then az highland homesteads up in prescott have two cherry trees yes that is awesome love it uh, the white paint on the trunks, can't that be any kind of paint? Will water-based paint or oil-based paint kill the tree? Yeah, so, uh, you know, for what I would suggest if is use one of two things if you're going to paint. Um, use the Arizona's Best tree trunk paint that you get from Home Depot or Lowe's here in town. Um, inexpensive, they've already got it pre-mixed for you. Um, it's in the right ratios. It's very inexpensive. Just go grab that. Um, if you want the organic route, make sure you use our discount code, but the three in one plant guard from Ivy Organics is a fantastic option as well. So I, I wouldn't really do anything else. Yes, you can mix your own paint. I don't know that you would save money doing it because the Arizona's best tree trunk paint is very inexpensive. So, um, yeah, it's an indoor latex paint though. So indoor latex paint mixed 50% water. So 50% latex paint indoor and 50% water is basically the ratio is my understanding. All right. I think we are caught up here and it is 408. Wow. This is great. Yeah. Very cool. Awesome. You guys. Well, really appreciate you guys being here. First live stream of the year. Mm -hmm. So that was really cool. Yeah. Um, had mentioned it at the very beginning. Um, we turned this into a podcast. So if you guys got jumped on late, and you want to see the beginning, you can watch it here on YouTube. That's great. We love it when you do. Um, but we will also have it up, hopefully within a week or two, on our website. And you can find all these in a shortened version because we do edit them down. Uh, on our website, you'll see it on our podcast page. It's the Desert Farmer Podcast. So I think we are about done, you guys. Yep. Uh, any other last questions while we're here? 
Oh, Daryl, <laughs> just noticed oh. you are no longer <laughs> sitting in front of the uh, the wine rack. Yeah, there's a there's a long short story to that, and mainly because of uh, the room that we're in right here is our office, and the we have shutters here instead of blinds. Well, I guess they are blinds, but shutters. And so it lets in a bit too much light. And we were finding that our darker wines were losing some color. Yeah. So we moved it into our workout room, which is always dark. And so we're just trying to keep that in the uh, in the dark. Yeah. Not you guys in the dark, the wine rack in the dark. Yes, yeah, so we moved it out so we could get a couch in here. And yeah, so we got this couch in here, which is our front room couch. But we need to get a new one. Yeah, yeah. we need to buy one. All right, yeah, we got some thumbs up. Awesome. awesome. You're awesome, thanks. That's your West Africa friend. Oh, very cool. About paint. Awesome. Okay, so West Africa wouldn't have access to that. So yeah, oh, 50% got it. Okay. In, uh, indoor latex paint, 50% water is is what you what you want to use. Uh, okay, bye everyone. See you, Daryl. The pathogen. I don't know what that is. Parenchia is what grows. Oh, hey, thank you, Brandon. Woohoo! That was awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, is what grows in the soil here when oh untreated grain water is grain water uh, is okay. used. It's painful. So that's probably why they do it then. Yeah. Maybe they're not I'm not gonna say that the government's not psycho sometimes, but yeah. <laughs> thank you, Brandon. That is awesome. So very cool. Thank you so much. That's neat. Yeah, that was cool. Right in here at the very end. That was neat. Yeah. All right. All right so we got some cool stuff today. So yeah. we're we're gonna wrap up. Thank you so much guys. Um Yep. Oh, yeah. And thumbs up. Thank you, guys. Um, so, June came in late. I uh, was trimming my mulberry trees after watching your video on pruning mulberries. Awesome, June. <laughs> That's why we put them out when we did. We tried to get ahead of it for everybody this year just for that. So, we've had a few folks. Kevin, I know, said he was planting a tree watching our video on planting a tree. Yeah. Which is so cool, you know, that we could be a part of all that with you guys. That's how we feel is that all of this stuff is you guys are our YouTube family. You know, we're empty nesters right now, so you know we uh, and we're we're farmers, so we don't get out much. <laughs> you guys are our chance to do that. <laughs> Just socialize. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, this is our social hour. It's why we have a cocktail while we're here with you guys, and yeah. <laughs> but no, this was really cool tonight because yeah. we we had a chance to answer some questions about pruning. Mm -hmm. um, we had a chance to meet somebody from West Africa, which you don't do every day. Yeah, that's right? really cool. Yeah. And we had. Um, questions on livestock, lots of questions, which is good. And then we have everybody that's starting these farms, and man. I'm so excited. You guys, we love to see pictures of your guys' mm -hmm. stuff as well. Yeah. So, you send know, them our way. Send them. You know, if you want to do a video, just a quick little tour. Hey, Elon. Video of your um, trees, food forest, what you got going on. We do have a playlist on our um, channel that we have viewers, like tour videos mm -hmm. um, that we would put up there. Um, so it's really cool, but we'd love to see what you guys have going on too. Yep. Um, uh, all right. So Aaron, so yeah, uh, Aaron, I know you so you got a question on there. So bye Jesus lover homesteads. Thanks for being here. So it, should we be on the lookout for springtime mm -hmm. diseases? Fire blight in mm -hmm. Arizona. I haven't heard of any major outbreaks no. in Arizona to look out for peach leaf curl, yep. ape, um, apple fungus. Mm -hmm. So uh, Reed at our site growers would tell you that you're killing your trees if you don't um, spray them. I won't disagree with him, but I can say we've never sprayed our trees in the wintertime in 20 years have, had not, have, have not had issues, not major ones. So, you know, healthy trees have a tendency to fight off just about anything. That being said, now is the time to put a dormant oil on your trees. So even if it's something as simple as neem, you can do that and it can definitely help with some of those um, pests that would be born from material that is dormant now. Uh, but keeping those trees healthy, Aaron, is the key. So, you know, plenty of sunlight, not overwatering, uh, pruning, you know, opening up the centers where you can to get airflow into the tree. Uh, those kind of things all definitely help. So, all yep. Right. Great to see you guys. Aaron, take it easy, man. And everybody, thanks for being here. Again, really love spending this time with you guys. You guys know we say this from time to time, but you know we're here on this planet for a limited time. And just that, time is the limiting factor. It's the most precious thing that we have here. You know, It's one of the reasons Lori and I spend so much time doing this farm together because it's time together and it's extremely valuable. So the fact that you guys spend time with us regularly we i we recognize all you guys so 
you know, being here with us means so much to us and it's very encouraging to us and we want to do the same for you guys, but really appreciate you being here. You know, we, we're going to miss probably some questions or comments. So if we do, obviously comment on our old videos. We got the vlog coming out tomorrow. Um, we want to continue to answer those. We'll do the best we can. But again, love having you guys here. Um, again, check out the podcast, the Desert Farmer Podcast on our website. You can see all the old episodes back there as well or listen to them uh, from the website as, as well. You can download them so you can take them with you. Uh, we'll do the same thing with this one. So again, really appreciate it, you guys, and uh, we will see you next time. Oh, and if we can farm on the edge of nowhere. So can you. Ah.